Hey, this is Sean Pickett. I'm the founder and CEO of Sales Integrity, a B2B tech sales coach, and your host for the Sales Integrity Podcast. I'm ready to make it another great podcast today. And with that, let's get today's episode rocking and rolling. Okay, welcome back to the Sales Integrity Podcast. I'm excited for today's guest. We have Brian Flanagan of Flanagan Training Group. Brian, you ready to rock and roll today and share some wisdom with our audience? Let's do it. Sean, awesome. I'm ready when you are. Awesome. Very good. Brian and I have known each other for, my, my goodness, over a decade at least. Yeah. We were trying to figure that out the other day when, when we had met. But uh, when I was talking with Brian, I said, I got to get you on for the podcast because I know our audience is really going to benefit from, from the wisdom that you share. Um, so nobody introduces themselves better than themselves, right, Brian? I mean, you know your background and, and you know that better than anyone. So I always like to start off with having my guests introduce themselves. So why don't we go ahead and uh, have you get started with that? Pretty simple introduction here. I started off as a delivery boy with IBM my second year at Louisiana State University as a senior. Got a job as a delivery boy, and that led to a 14-year career with the IBM Corporation. Now, Sean, I'm going to date myself here. <laughs> I sold typewriters and copiers with the IBM Corporation. So I was, a, I was an office products peddler. But that moved me from sales to sales training at the National Training Center, moved me out to California as a sales manager, as a people manager. Then I came back as a senior account rep. 1984, I had been impacted by Zig Ziglar six years prior, 1978. And I had a chance to go to work for Zig in 1984 and spent the last 33 years in this industry. The last few years since we've met, I've had Flanagan Training Group. Mm -hmm. So my career is very, very easy, very simple from IBM to the Ziegler Corporation, to my company, and it's treated me well. That's great. So you mentioned LSU. That's where you went to the college, and I understand you played basketball there, right? Well, I was on the team. There's a difference between <laughs> being on the team and playing. I, you, I happened to go out without a scholarship. The last scholarship went to the coach's son, a guy <laughs> named Pete Maravich. I don't know how he got my scholarship. <laughs> so I was on the team with Pete as freshman. In those days, freshmen couldn't play varsity. Yeah. I had the opportunity to see the beginnings of the greatest offensive player in the history of college basketball with Pistol Pete Maravich. That's I didn't great. play a lot, but I learned a lot. One of the things I learned is to be humble. One night we won at home, playing at home, we won playing an AAU team, a local AAU basketball team. We won by 54 points, and I didn't play. Coach explained to me he didn't want to jeopardize the lead. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, I learned quickly that my future was not going to be as an SEC basketball player. But I will report this. Pete Maravich and I combined for 54 points one night. <laughs> he got 53. So it was a short life career, if you will. It sounds like you learned a lot. Be humble, and I'm sure the competitive nature in you, uh, you were able to bring that forward into the uh, profession of sales, right? Yeah, that, that really forged my way into what I did later in life. So it was a humbling experience, but also learned something very valuable. Pete Maravich was not born that way. He, he worked. I, I watched him in practice. I had to practice against him. One of the reasons I made the team, Sean, is that they had to fill out the roster to have enough people to practice against. <laughs> but I, I saw him work on a day-to-day -day basis, and his skills were unbelievable. He brought those skills to the game. The other thing I learned is that he – he increased the play of other people. You had to be paying attention when you played with Pete Maravich because he would embarrass you if you weren't looking for a pass that nobody saw coming. So your head was on a swivel all the time trying to stay up. It, it was an amazing season. It was a humbling season, but I sure did learn a lot, yes. And I, and I think that it helped me in the sales profession as well. That's excellent. So let's talk about that sales profession. You start at IBM. You know, what's the number one thing you learned while, while being at IBM and, and starting off your sales career there? One of the things I learned from the company, not necessarily from the sales area, but from the company, IBM had three standards and they, they adhered to these standards the 14 years I was there. Number one, respect for the individual. Number two, pursue every job with a, with a manner of excellence. And number three, to provide customer service that was world class. And those three things helped me in sales, helped me in management, helped me running my own business. 
the cornerstone that IBM had, had set in me were really strong. And I went in as a delivery boy and came out as a salesman. And I felt very fortunate to have that experience. IBM was very nice to me. I left in 1984 and a lot of things have changed, mm -hmm. but my, the, the foundation that I got with IBM was strong. Yeah. And so that foundation you then took with you to, to the Zig Ziglar Corporation. So right. I'm dying to hear about this. Zig is one of one of my, you know, idols and growing up uh, reading all his books and watching his uh, videotapes and motivational tapes and what he referred to as Automobile University. When right. I was a young sales professional, yeah. I'd always listen to listen to him in the car and all that stuff. So I'm just dying to learn, you know, how did you first get hooked up with Zig? You know, that story. And then you know, going into your 32 years with Zig, you've had to learn more than one thing or two, you know, from Zig working side by side with him. When I got in 1978, when they promoted me, I was not a very good salesperson. Now that doesn't mean I didn't sell a lot. I did sell a lot. I, I sold my car and I sold my furniture. <laughs> I was struggling as a salesperson, but I did a lot of things well. And I got lucky. I, I moved from sales to field sales area of IBM to the National Training Center as a sales instructor who couldn't sell those who can do those who can't teach those who can't teach teach sales. <laughs> so I got to, got to downtown Dallas to the national training center. I was competing for the next job with people from large company, large cities, same mm -hmm. company, large cities. Kathy was from Chicago, Linda was from New York, Ron was from Seattle, Roger was from Boston. And I didn't think I could compete being from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So one of my buddies said, go out and buy a book. So for $12.95, I went to a downtown bookstore in Dallas, Texas, and I purchased a book by a man named Zig Ziglar. Had never heard of him before. The name of the book was See You at the Top. Mm. I get to page 48 and one sentence, Sean, changed my life. 39 years ago, still impacts my life to this day. And that one sentence said, you cannot consistently perform in a manner that's inconsistent with the way you see yourself. And I didn't see myself as being successful. IBM had taught me intellectually how to sell, but I never felt successful as a salesperson. Mm -hmm. And what Zig Ziglar was saying, Brian, increase your deserve level. And I tell people at that point in my life, I was missing success by a distance of 12 inches. And that's distance from my head to my heart. Mm -hmm. And once, I, once Zig told me that he was going to build the person, let IBM build the professional, bring those together, then everything changed. So I owe Zig a great deal of, of, of my sales success and certainly my business success and a lot of my personal and family success because of his teachings. And his teachings, if you know anything about Zig, his teaching was very simple, had one sentence. You can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. But yeah. That's what I thought sales should be. And you know about integrity and selling. And, and, and if you're pushing something on someone, mm -hmm. That's not integrity-based selling. But if you're helping them get what they want, then over a period of time, you'll receive the benefits and the rewards accordingly. Yeah. So I always dig a lot. But he, the, my favorite way to introduce Zig, Sean, was that he's the most consistent man I've ever met. Because mm -hmm. every, everything he did in different, from business to family to personal to faith, he was consistent. And man, that's hard to do in this day and age. There's too many things going on that allow a person to be consistent. But Zig handled all of that. And that, that was one of the great lessons that I learned with Zig. Yeah. And that one statement is what I've kind of based my whole career around is helping enough other people get what they want. You, you in turn will get what you want. So I wholeheartedly believe in that. See You at the Top was the first book I remember ever reading, believe it or not, other than like when you're a child in elementary school and the, the books you're forced to read. I mean, the, the books that I went out and actually sought out and, and read. My dad has a massive library of motivational, inspirational books and all that. And that was the one that kind of popped out to me. And he would always listen to Zig Ziglar. So I grew very fond of Zig and his Southern uh, twang and the way he, his delivery style and all, all that good stuff as well. And we're going to talk about presentation skills here in just a little bit. But before we do, and we're talking about styles, there, there's three what I refer to as Flanagan-isms. Uh -oh. Knowing you for, for over a decade now, I, there's three Flanagan-isms, things that are kind of endearing to you, uh, your mantras, if you will, that I really enjoy. So I wanted to kind of get to the, get to the bottom of those and the root, root of those to figure out where did they come from. So the first thing is, and I pay attention to everything, I'm very detailed when it comes to that, as you know. So at the end of every 
email. I notice that your your you kind of your uh, salutation there. You always say grow get them instead of go get them. Grow get grow get them. I love that. Where did that come from, and what does that mean? One of the things I learned being in sales is that if you look at a list of what you like about selling, what you dislike about selling, well, people like the fact that they can make money, they have freedom, they can help people, they can build relationships. What they don't like is rejection, the uncertainty, and the stigma. And once I understood that, and I, and I use this in my sales seminars and my sales trainings, is that if you look at that list, there's not one policy, procedure, or product on either side of the like or the dislike list. Mm -hmm. So what connects the likes and the dislikes is not how it's not so much the logical side of selling, but the emotional side of selling because salespeople get beat up. Mm -hmm. Now, Sean, I'm, I'm an accidental salesperson. I wanted to be a high school basketball coach. Mm -hmm. So I, cause I was raised the same way you were, your mom and dad raised you the same as mine did. They said, don't talk to strangers. Don't ask people for money. So we go into sales <laughs> and for some of it, it's counterintuitive. So we're going to hear no, the word no, more often than other professionals. So I always tried to gear myself up. And I see other professionals that get kicked a few times to hear no. They, they feel they're being rejected. And they just need some encouragement. So one of the things that I started using was grow get them as opposed to go get them. Just grow get them because you have to grow into being a sales professional. Most people are accidental sales people. So I like the term grow, get them. It's different. Hopefully it gets you, it got your attention. So that's when I started using it and it caught on and thank you for the, for the feedback. I got feedback on it and I continue to use it. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. It's unique to you. You get feedback. It stands out. And of course, you know, with, we'll, we'll talk about social selling and kind of a crowded, you know, marketplace of, of, of competitors out there. You, you want to be different. You want to stand out. You want to be unique. Um, in, in what you do. I, my, my mantra and my salutation I always use is make it a great day. You've probably noticed that and right. people have noticed that. I've used that back since the 90s when I was young, Sean, and, and starting and selling and all that. And cold calling was the only method that you could use. And I would always end every cold call voicemail with make it a great day. And occasionally I would get my call backs from VPs of IT or CIOs and they'd be kind of monotone, Sean, I got your voicemail. I'm just returning your call. And then at the end they go, Oh, and Sean, you make it a great day. Well, that's and good. it always kind of stood out, you know, and I, I had that feedback from those prospective customers that became customers about that. And I even get chided by friends and, and colleagues that know me real well saying, Oh man, you know, make it a great day. Where'd that come from? Yeah. Just like your grow, get them there's a story behind that. For me, you don't have a great day. Nothing happens to you. You right. make it happen. So that's where I kind of replace that to, to put in, make it a great day. So and of course, your grow, out. yeah, your grow, get them stood out to me because I kind of mirrored what, what I saw. And I, I knew there had to be a reason why you, you put that in there. So I was just dying to hear. And I thought the audience would benefit from it. Maybe it's the Irish in us. Uh, yeah, it could be. We get a little too clever maybe with our uh, <laughs> greetings and salutations, right? Yeah. Um, so the next Flanaganism, learn, laugh, and grow. Where did that come from? What does that mean? If you want to have a good day, if you want to have a good day every day, just follow those three principles. Learn something, laugh a little bit, grow in your relationships, grow in your, your mental, physical, faith-based, spiritual and, and I think that it's, it's as salespeople, we need to have fun. Mm -hmm. I believe that selling is fun because it's people related. It has challenges. My gosh, it has challenges. Yet at the same time, it, it's a fun profession because it's the people side of things. Mm -hmm. so the first thing that, that I want my, my brand to be is that you can learn something. And so I'm, I want to be educational. Secondly, I want to be entertaining. I don't want to be entertaining first. I want to be educational first and then take those two together and you'll, you'll grow through your career, not go through your career. Mm -hmm. so that, that's where that, those three words. And my, my son helped me with that. Uh, my son said, dad, as, as I've observed, it seems like you you want to be a teacher. When, when I go to your presentations, people have fun. And then when I leave your presentations, I feel like I've learned enough to grow. So that's where we came up with those three words. 
That's great. And, the, and those three tie into the last one, your mission. I've noticed, I read this on your website when I was doing a little bit of research before our, our interview here. And your mission is to educate, entertain, and encourage was the third E there. Uh, you got the alliteration going, which I really yeah. like. So I'm, um, I'm, I like alliteration. Yeah, I do too. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. So uh, you, you kind of explained a little bit, but anything to add on the educate, entertain, and encourage, and maybe more the encourage part, because you talked a little bit about the educate and entertain. Yeah, and the encourage part is may, maybe a little bit where that the common thread to grow get them comes from. When I started in this industry, when I was still with IBM, I had a side business, a moonlighting business, if you will, for five years while I was with IBM trying to get into the business. One of the great lessons that Zig taught me, he said, don't quit your day job. <laughs> so when I went to him and said, I, I, I'm interested in this industry, he said, well, there's a couple of things you need to do. And I joined a couple of organizations. I did a few things, but yet I found that I was, I was being moved into the area where I wanted to entertain people. And that was not good because mm -hmm. in my focus of entertaining people, uh, some of these people wanted to be educated. So after about four or five years of doing that on my own, when I joined Zig, I realized that I needed to put education first. Mm -hmm. and then the entertainment. And I, and I really made that switch. And I think that's, that's why I've, I've lasted as long as I have. And then the encouragement is everybody needs encouragement. We get beat up. Like you said, on social media, the mm -hmm. space is full. Mm -hmm. So is selling. So mm -hmm. are your markets. So are your, everybody can be an entrepreneur. Anybody, and you and I know this in our industry, anybody that's one, as we used to say it, but anybody that's one a pin, or a pencil set from the Dale Carnegie sales course is now a speaker, is now a trainer. So it's a tough business. There's low entry, low capital to get into it. All you need is some guts and a phone to pick up and go. Mm -hmm. and so you need some encouragement along the way. And, and I think that that's one of the things that I provide. So that educate, entertain, and encourage are, are the three things that, that I focus on. Excellent. And, I, and it's interesting hearing you tell the story about you, you were starting to entertain a little more than you were educating and, and Zig having you balance that back and leading in with the educate. That's probably why you have that first ahead of entertain. But, you know, humor and entertainment is part of the process because it could become mundane process, this learning thing and trying to develop and improve your skills. So I like that educate, entertain and encourage. And, you know, I, I'm kind of the family storyteller, large Irish family, right? I'm one of seven kids. So, you know, there's five boys, two girls. And now, son, I, I, heard, I heard it was, I heard it was so crowded when you grew up, you never slept alone until after you were married. <laughs> That's what I heard. That, that, that's great. That is, I'm going to have to steal that and use that uh, for myself. That, thanks, way, I, I call that legitimate plagiarism. If you're telling the author, you're going to steal their content and use it later. <laughs> but what, one thing I learned um, from my grandfather, we called him B-Pop. He, he, uh, he always said, Sean, there's a difference between being a character and having character, <laughs> right? And, you know, it's oh. kind of your educate and entertain discussion you had with Zig Ziglar, you know, where you want to educate first and then you can be a character through the process, but make sure they don't lose sight of the message that you're trying to convey, right? Yeah, yeah, very much so. That's and the cool. other thing about encouragement, Sean, you know that salespeople sometimes get beat up out there. Yeah. And I, I say that to salespeople that we're all manic depressive. And, and for you young people, that means we're bipolar. <laughs> people, when, when salespeople are selling, they, they're so happy, they grin so broadly, they could eat a banana sideways. And <laughs> not, they get so depressed that they look like the picture on their driver's license. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that, especially if you're working solo, if you're a remote, you need encouragement. You need to find encouragement. And that's what Zig taught me. And, and you've heard him say this. Somebody would come up to him back many years ago and say, well, Mr. Ziegler, Man, once I get into a sales slump, I just plug your, in those days it was cassettes. Mm -hmm. Zig, I'd plug that cassette and I'd get out of that sales slump. And Zig would say, well, partner, let me ask you this. Why don't you put the cassettes in before you get into a sales slump? <laughs> Help you avoid it, right? And that's the encouragement. That's right. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm going to ask you a question that I ask all of my guests, and I always look forward to, to the answer. As you know, Brian, I've named my company Sales Integrity. You alluded yep. to that earlier, Selling with Integrity. And um, in, in Integrity, I found, means something a little bit different to, you know, to everyone. Uh, the most common definition I've always heard is doing what's right, doing the right thing when nobody's looking, right? Yeah. But everybody has their different twist on that. So how do you, how does Brian Flanagan define 
sales integrity or what it means to have integrity as a sales professional, especially in today's modern selling world? Get your pencils out, folks. Here it comes. All, all you <laughs> right. get your pencils out. Here it comes. The intention behind your technique determines your integrity. The intention behind your technique determines your integrity. In my heart of hearts, if I know what I'm selling to this person is going to work, I've, I've done my due diligence, I've gone through the process, and in your audience's case, a lot of times, Sean, it's a complex sale, and they've got all the, the stakeholders involved, mm -hmm. and they know it's a good fit. In their heart of hearts, if they know it's a good fit, then any technique they use is integrity-based. However, if you're trying to force fit something, if you know it's not the right fit, then you've got to stop get back into the discovery stage and make sure that what you're recommending is going to work for this person. And that, that, that may be easier or hard for some people, but I, th I think it's a pretty straight line that if I'm in my heart of hearts, this, this product was invented to help you solve this, then I need to go forward. But if I know that maybe there's a couple of things that we need to tweak, then I need to step back before I start closing so I can start investigating to make sure that what I'm delivering will move you forward. And sometimes it means you've got to walk away from what you thought would be a good prospect because it may not be a good fit. Yeah, I love that. So I'm going to re read this back to you to make sure I got this. I got my pen out. I didn't have a pencil, yeah. but intention behind your technique determines your integrity. Right. There, right. I love that. And, and I stole that. If you steal from me, you're stealing twice. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to use that. Um, mainly because it, that, and not exactly that, that words, I do talk about intention a lot. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. when, when, you know, we're working with sales professionals and coaching them, you know, in the tech industry and we, we talk about, you know, I always like to use analogy of game day versus everything leading up to game day, right. being an athlete and you know, ex athlete and talking about, you know, knowing the discipline it takes to create a game plan, practice all during the week, you know, make sure you get it right before you get into game day. Game day would be live situations that you're in uh, with prospects and partners and customers, right? But everything leading up to game day is behind the scenes, how much you're practicing. And most common thing I hear from reps is, I hate doing that. I hate role playing or I hate scripts because, you know, I just don't want to sound scripted. And I always tell them, you know, if you don't want to sound scripted, then don't sound scripted. You know, rehearse it so much, make it so inherent to how you communicate. Everything you're saying now, at one point you learned it was new, right? But it's your intention behind how you're communicating that, you know, as to whether you feel like you're being manipulative or, or not, right? And so right. influence and persuasion can be, you know, have negative connotations or could have positive connotations. It's, it's all based on your intention, right? Right. I agree. Right. Great. Well, let's shift gears a little bit to your niche topic of presentation skills. I think by far you really focus on this quite a bit, um, you know, from our discussions, just knowing you and, and go through your website and knowing, I, I kind of see, I call it the Facebook Chronicles and LinkedIn Chronicles where I see, you know, I track those that I, that I enjoy tracking like yourself. Some, some would call it socially lurking, right? <laughs> but just kind of keeping an eye on, hey, what, what is Brian doing? You're doing some great things out there as it relates to helping organizations and people with presentation skills. Can you talk a little bit about your work there and, and you know, maybe what's the number one challenge you see that sales professionals have as it relates to presentation skills? Um, let's just start there, let's say. Biggest problem I see is comfort. Okay. I was at a big conference in Brooklyn, New York, and they had these all these remote independent contractors. The number one guy stood up and they wanted him to give an impromptu, how had how, how you become number one? Mm -hmm. And the, the Here's a number one salesperson in an organization, I think about 250, 260 people. And there were probably 240 in the room. And he stood up and he grabbed the microphone. And as he was telling people how he became number one, he dipped. Hmm. He, he take a little sidestep and dip. He was comfortable doing that. But everyone was distracted. The number one thing I see in sales professionals when they're making sales presentations is that they get comfortable and they lose their effectiveness. People tell me all the time, I don't need a presentation skills course. I'm comfortable in front of a group of people. Mm. I'll then whisper in their ear, have you ever seen yourself? Because you're not very good. <laughs> and, and comfort kills careers. That's one of my mantras. Again, comfort kills careers, simply meaning that in your comfort zone, you can't grow. You can't ask the tough questions. 
You can't close at the right times because your comfort zone is debilitating. The same is true in presentations. When you stand in front of a group, people tell me this all the time. When I get nervous, it's because I'm being judged, people are watching me, and I tell them, where is the audience in your answer? What do you mean? It's always about you. It's never about the audience. You're nervous not because of the audience will gain. It's mm -hmm. because you're being judged. You're put on the spot. And what I'm trying to do with my 11 presentation skills is take the attention off myself and focus it where it belongs on the other person, on the subject matter, on the committee. And yeah. that's the biggest thing I see is that the center of attention, especially with salespeople, is usually shining on themselves and not on the subject nor on the prospect. Yeah, that's great. So these 11 presentation skills that, that you refer to, we, we don't have time to go over all 11, but do you want to pick maybe one of them out and just give a high level on what maybe the audience should be thinking about as it relates to presentation skills? I joined my first Toastmasters club. I went to the club. I fell in love with it. If you don't know what Toastmasters is, toastmasters.org. I then gave, came back the next week and I was giving my icebreaker, my four to five minute icebreaker. So I came in, I said, who's going to be my evaluator? And the masters of ceremonies that day said, well, unfortunately, the English professor from LSU, Nick the Knife Van Chrysler, is going to be your, <laughs> be your evaluator. So Very I nice. panicked. I stood up and went four minutes and 35 seconds. I hit my time zones. I didn't faint, didn't throw up, sat down. Nick stands up and said, Brian, good organization. It'll help you in the future. Oh, by the way, tonight I counted in your presentation. You said us uh, 16 times. That'll cost you $4. I said, I'm sorry, Nick. I owe you $4. He said, no, you don't owe me $4. You owe the up pot $4. Every time you say uh, and we catch you, you owe a quarter to the up pot. Showing my first year in Toastmasters, I financed two club picnics. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest thing I hear, the biggest thing I, I, I observe when you leave a voicemail, when you're talking on a prospecting call. It's amazing how many padding filler words that we have. They don't need to hear the sound of your search engine. Uh, 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 they don't need to hear that. Salespeople get into that mode and it's amazing the likes that you know is the right, right, right. That is so distracting. You can separate yourself from the competition by getting rid of that white noise, by, mm -hmm. by taking those verbal viruses out of your presentation. That's the biggest thing that I've seen, and it, it, it spans all age groups. It's not just the young folks coming into sales. It's yep. veterans because we get into that pattern. So the biggest thing I, I hear and see in presentations are the words that are distracting and detracting. Okay. So how, if I'm, if I'm one of the audience members listening to this right now, it begs the question, how do I alleviate that? How do I recognize I'm doing it? And then how do I alleviate that from my lexicon? Three ways. Number one, first of all, you have to understand the cure is nothing. Don't take the uh out and throw in an um. The cure is silence. Think in silence. Number two, talk in complete sentences. We were taught to write in complete sentences, but we don't speak in complete sentences. I went to the store and I went to the movies as a compound sentence. That and belongs there. I went to the store and I went to, and did you see that playoff game last night? And did you see that playoff game last night does not begin with an and. It begins mm -hmm. with did you. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things we have to understand is when we speak in complete sentences, we take care of some of those padding words, those filler words. And the biggest thing you can do is become aware of the tendencies. How do you become aware of the tendencies? When you leave a voicemail, now you may want to do this internal to your organization. When you leave a voicemail, they'll say, if you'd like to re-record your message, if you'd like to listen to your message, to press that key, listen back to what you just said. I've done that. Mm -hmm. And it was so bad, I've erased and started again. Mm -hmm. If you're real serious about this, Sean, you'll put it on speakerphone, you'll turn to your keyboard as you're listening to that voicemail that you just left. Type everything that you just heard yourself say. Uh, um, hack, splute, whatever it is, type it out, <laughs> print it, then you can see how you sound, and that'll be a way to start eliminating some of those padding words, those excessive fellow words. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be aware and serious about your, your communication game. Yes. Right? When yeah. you're asking close-ended questions, you're getting no, no, no. 
it says that your questioning skills aren't, aren't good. Yes. The same is true when you hear yourself, when you hear it on a recording, that the first step in breaking a habit is to become aware of the habit. So that's exactly right. Yeah, that's great. Great advice. And hopefully the audience can take that and run with it. You know, I would suggest, you know, uh, you know, pal up with one of your peers, it role play back and forth or leave voicemails for each other and then listen to it. But you got to work on it, right? It's amazing that we as sales professors would, would much rather go practice and lose a sale than go to a conference room and practice with a coworker and get better at it. We don't want to be embarrassed in front of our coworker, yet we'll risk losing a sale by practicing in front of a prospect <laughs> or a customer. It's amazing. It's amazing. amazing. So let's talk about the, the sales profession as, as a whole here. Yeah. What encourages you most about the sales profession today in the modern selling world? A couple of things. Number one, no matter how much social media we've had over the past several years, selling is still an important profession mm -hmm. because what salespeople do matters. What they do is worthy. And oftentimes we, we don't accept that. So I, I think that we're seeing an, a rebirth of that. The other thing, because you and I recently met at the University of Texas at Dallas, there's a whole group of universities and colleges throughout the nation, about 40 or 42 of them, who are certified sales professional centers which mean they're giving degrees in the profession of selling. Mm -hmm. That's a college of business, it may be in marketing, it may be a focus, but you can get a degree in selling. You can take 12 to 15 hours and you're ahead of the competition when you go out and compete for a job. They're teaching the right type of sales. They're not teaching stimulus response. They're teaching a process-based, focused on the client type of sales. And I think that's helping the sales profession. And we're, we're raising up a new generation of salespeople. I'm yeah. excited about that. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm, I'm excited about that as well. That, that program at UTD, is they're just doing a wonderful job over there. Uh, that was my first experience. You've been involved with that for, for quite some time. I, I, I was involved as a volunteer judge for their rookie sales preview. So these are new students that just joined the program in their first semester, I believe. And this is kind of their showcase where they're being filmed in a room role playing with a buyer as we're watching in a different room and, and judging them based on all the criteria there. So that's, that's difficult as it is. And I give them a lot of credit for, for stepping up and doing that. But just that was my first experience. And I thought, wow, if these are rookies, I'd love to see the more experienced students yeah. because they are doing it the right way. It's impressive. Yeah, and employers are seeing that, and employers are coming in and saying, we want to support this program because we see the value of that. So I'm excited about that. I truly am. Yeah, and Salesforce.com was involved with that. I know other large organizations. I believe there was over 200 corporate sponsors or companies that were there, and this is a kind of, a, a, a in a good way, a good breeding ground for developing the new up-and-coming sales talent, and what a wonderful resource for the, the you know, local companies to go in there and recruit from. And I've even met with some that, that have recruited and some of these students are finishing up their degree and selling for these companies. And boy, are they impressive. So when did you first get involved with that program and, and kind of what is your involvement with that? Several years ago, I was giving a pre, I was doing a full day sales training in Phoenix, Arizona to a group of manufacturing reps. There was one table that had an older guy and then these five or six younger people, men and women. And during one of the work groups, I, I walked over to this table and I said, what's your deal? And the man said, I'm a professor at Florida State University and these are the students. This company supports my program at Florida State and they hire these people. And so th these kids, they're interviewing this week. Well, whoa. So we got together. He invited me to come and I, I made a couple of presentations to his sales classes. Then he asked me to come present at the sales Educators Academy, which is a nationwide, well, actually international now, they bring these PhDs in who are teaching sales in these universities, mm -hmm. and they have a two and a half day workshop on how they can do it better. So I drank the Kool-Aid. I just thought what they were doing was great. I got involved with Dr. Howard Dover here at the University of Texas at Dallas, and I've just been involved. I, I like what they're doing. I enjoy working with the kids. I coach the kids. I, I, tr I try to be a substitute professor, if you will, when one of them has to go out of town, if I can take over his or her class. So mm -hmm. I think that they're raising up a new, as I say, a new generation of salespeople the right way, because Sean, they're teaching it's not a personality, it's a mm -hmm. process. Yeah, 
Exactly. That's the biggest mistake that I made early in my sales career is that I thought selling was a personality. And because I was Irish and I could put a sentence together, I thought I could sell. And I was wrong for several years. Yep. Yeah, it, 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 it is very encouraging to see that those university programs, you mentioned the Sales Educators Academy. If someone wants to get involved with that, volunteer time to be a judge or help the students or want to go and recruit from there, be a corporate sponsor, which I know the universities you know, need that to keep the programs going. Um, how would they get involved with that? What would they go find or search you know, for, for, to get involved with that? Two ways to do that. Find your local college, your local university. Mm -hmm. Find the business department, see what they're doing because everybody's teaching sales. Not of them, have, not all of them are certified as a professional sales center, mm -hmm. but they do have classes. And I'm getting more and more calls from from local Texas around the Texas area colleges and universities because they're putting in at least an introductory to sales. I didn't have that when I was. Mm -mm. Neither did I. Uh, secondly, go to the Sales Education Foundation (SES) Sales Education Foundation. Young lady up there named Marty Holmes will, will give you information. You, you can find out how to get plugged in. There's statistics on what's going on, how it's going. It, it's a remarkable organization that's it's well kept secret. It shouldn't be. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. and, and admire that, that you're stepping out and making that available on your podcast here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for, you know, the millennial generation gets uh, a lot of grief from a lot of people, <laughs> you know, thinking that, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to exasperate what, what people say about them, you know, but I've heard some negative commentary about them. Well, if you want to change your opinion, go get involved with one of these local uh, universities agree. that are part of that sales education foundation, get involved as a judge and watch them in action. Uh, they'll completely shift your, your mindset and shift yeah. your paradigm on that. And I'm you, pretty you, impressed with them. You felt that way, and this was an introductory to sales. These are the yeah. people that are taking introductory to sales. These aren't the people that have committed. These students haven't committed to going into the full-blown sales course. Yeah, exactly. So you're seeing from very strong, yeah, valuable yeah. people, very talented people at that level, and they're just at the, the threshold of. Yeah. Yeah. And just to clarify, I didn't feel the negative connotations for it. I, I felt strongly about it when I went and uh, got involved sure, as a yeah. judge, uh, just for, for those that are listening out there. But it, it really is impressive. And I wish something like that existed when I came up through the ranks, but it's here now. And, you know, as much as we can get involved with it to, to help the cause, the, the better with that. So that's great. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk social selling. Because I noticed one thing, um, you know, even at UTD and, and, and meeting with some of the students and talking about it, I was actually found through LinkedIn by one of the students involved in the program. And I know they had a quota, you know, to be able to, to recruit as many corporate sponsors and judges to get them there. And they had a huge involvement with that. So that was, that was um, they did a great job of, of meeting and exceeding their quota, I think, overall, from what Dr. Dover uh, had mentioned. So social selling, it seems to be a real hot topic. It seems to be all the rage these days, right? Um, so social technologies like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, really have taken the, the selling scene by storm. Given that, uh, what's your take on social selling and do you have a tip, one tip maybe you could share with our audience on how to make the most of social selling as part of your overall sales arsenal? The key is what you just said. It's a part of your sales arsenal. Here's my concern, even with the kids that I work with at UTD. Don't hide behind social media. You, you've got to, there's nothing wrong with texting, but you've got to learn how to extend your hand, grab somebody's hand, squeeze it and look them in the eye and have a sales call. I think that's too often we're taking the easy way out. Mm -hmm. and, and I hear this all the time and you see it also, Sean, cold calling is dead. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this since 1970. Cold calling has always been dead <laughs> for those who don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's always been dead. It's always been frightening. So when social media comes in, what's happened is that they think that they're replacing the face-to-face, the, -face, the eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball with, with all the social media. Some people want to be text. Some people want to be email. Mm -hmm. and at the same time, that should be part of your strategy, not the only strategy. Because if we have a strategy that's only social media based, we're losing the tactics of making an effective sales call. Yeah. And that's what I pride myself in. I, I'm not a strategic, I'm not a strategic seller. I'm a tactical seller. So yeah. once you get the social media going, once you get those, those connections, here's the question. What do you say when you get there? 
Yep. You use a process, I call it POGO, P-O-G-O, Person, Organization, Goals, and Obstacles. Some people call it SPIN. Some mm -hmm. people call it whatever, Challenge or Sale. There's a hundred. But I've been using POGO for a while because it's, it's centered on the other person. What do you say once you get there? That's mm -hmm. the problem with social media. It's got to be a part. It can't be a standalone. It's got to be a part of what you do in your sales activities. Yeah. So my, my caution is, yes, learn a social media function. And it may be LinkedIn. It may be your Facebook page. It may be Twitter. Find something, but work it within the overall tactics as well as the strategy. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So if, if social selling seems to be all the rage, it's, it's chief rival is cold calling. As you had mentioned, that's equally as polarizing as social selling as a topic that's out there. So how do you define cold calling? You mentioned, Hey, it's been dead since the seventies. How do you define it? Cause I think part of the problem is people aren't really defining cold calling the same way. If they're thinking it's the old days of here's a book handed to you by your manager of name, just pick up the phone and start calling in a whimsical nature without any research and knowing what you're talking about and mapping what their, what their needs are to what you can help them with. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't make sense. But how do you define it? And is it dead? And how can it be effective? Well, cold calling can be anything. Cold calling can be a name. I'm calling you out of the blue. Cold calling can be, Sean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in touch with Ralph Watts, and Ralph's a good guy. You now have a referral. That's a form of cold calling. And I don't know how to define cold calling without having an industry. So I think it's your industry. It's your, your in sales environment, mm -hmm. what you're into, because some of them are, are pretty tight-knit fraternities. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah, it, it depends and it varies. But cold calling is initiating a contact with somebody that you really don't know. Mm -hmm. Somebody that you may have a referral, but it's the initiating of the contact. And I think that's what slows a lot of salespeople down. All you're trying to do is say, Sean, I've got a, I've got a system that works. We've not done business with your company. I want to know how can I introduce my solutions, the benefit of my solutions to you. It's mm -hmm. the initiation of some type of, it's the initiation of the process. That, yeah. That's one of the ways I define it. I'm not sure it's a, it's the best definition. It's a good but, one. But social selling is dead also for people that don't want to use it. Mm -hmm. Social selling is dead for people that don't use it well. Mm -hmm. uh, tactical selling is dead for it's, it's all in the, the eye of the beholder, but it's also in, in the feet and hands of the person that is proactively doing this. Mm -hmm. So if there's an element about selling that you don't like, closing is dead for some people. Yep. But it's a necessary part of the sales process. No matter how you prospect, whether it be social media, whether it be referral, whether it be direct mail, or whether it be picking up the phone and calling, or what I did recently, I canvassed a building. Mm. I got kicked out of that building, but <laughs> I still canvassed the building. And that's what we used to do before no solicitation signs were up. So it's a way of getting into and, and starting the process. And yeah. it's not the whole selling cycle. It's just a part of that cycle. Mm -hmm. It's initiating it. So how can social selling and cold calling work hand in hand, work together? Referrals. Mm -hmm. Much like the person that, that reached out to you and, and said wh whatever they he or she saw on your website, that connected them. They had a past experience. They've done their research. They connected one of what you do to a need that you may have or a need that you may have to give back and a need that they have. And I just think that's the way to do it. I've got something that may help solve your problem. How do I introduce that? And, that, and that's cold calling. And it can be, hey, Mr. Flanagan, I'm so-and-so, and I got out my purpose of my call. But the biggest mistake we make tactically is we put our purpose before we put our benefit. Mm -hmm. So if I'm calling on you, Sean, and I, here's what I want to do. As opposed to Sean, our clients find value in the fact that we help save or reduce whatever. Now the purpose of my call is, I think we need to put the benefit before we put the purpose. Mm -hmm. But we're not educated in that. Pick mm -hmm. up the phone and call. Go get them, Tiger. Yeah. That's a tough way to make a living. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Brian, this has been fun and we're nearing the end of our time together today. So that means one thing here on the Sales Integrity Podcast. It's time for the sales cycle. 
Hit me with your best shot. I'm ready. <laughs> the I am sales ready. cycle. So you told me this was this was the lightning round. Yep, yep. The sales cycle is obviously a process that all sales professionals go through when they're guiding opportunities uh, through through that that sales cycle to to close your hopefully in a, in a successful outcome. But here on the show, it's the name of our lightning round. Okay, so I'm going to ask you seven questions in rapid fire format, and I'm going to time you to make it fun. I time all my guests to see, you know, we're going to tap into that competitive nature and see right. who, who, who is the best. So our previous guest, who you know really well, Stu Schlackman, he holds the record, and it's one minute and 55 seconds. You think you could beat your friend Stu? How much leeway do I have to answer in a paragraph, or can I just answer? Well, keep something in mind that our audience has to glean some value out of oh, this. Oh, okay, good. Okay, you can't, you can't I, I, just, I, I'm you know, still up for the challenge. <laughs> you can't just give one word answers. And uh, oh. if you do, then I'm going to ask you to elaborate. And that's all part of the game here. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll follow your instructions. You haven't lied to me yet. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. So I've got the timer right here. I'm going to start it and I'll ask our first question. And I'll stop it when we're done with our seventh question. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. Here we go. First question, name a specific technology or tool you use for identifying and researching target market prospects. I use LinkedIn because that's where I'm comfortable and effective. I don't understand the rest of them. And I, link, LinkedIn has been very beneficial to me. Okay. Question number two, what is the best method to initially get the attention of and connect with your target market prospects? Ooh, I, I mentioned that earlier. Anytime you're connecting with somebody, you've got to give them value before you give your purpose. State the benefit to them before you ask them for something. Okay, great. Question number three, what method do you use to consistently stay top of mind if your prospects aren't ready to buy just yet? Handwritten notes. Not Handwritten notes. because they're so, they're so rare. Whether it be yeah. sent out cards or I've got a little postcard, but handwritten notes. Great. Number four, what sales process methodology do you use to manage opportunities through the sales cycle? I, ha I don't have a CRM per se because I've been using my own little method and it's homegrown and unfortunately not, not recommended, but there's a lot of paper, paper and pencil. Okay. That's the method that I use. Great. And uh, question number five, how do you define the concept of closing a sale? the intersection of their being aware of a need and having enough pain or status quo mentality of wanting to get better and the fact that you've got a solution to help, help them get better. Okay. Question six, how do you know when it's time to close a sale for any given opportunity? That's the downside of using social media. I don't know on social media. Face-to-face, -face, I can look at you as you nod your head. Mm -hmm. I can ask the question. If, in fact, I can pr provide something, what would it be? If, you, if I'm confident we can do this, how do I transfer that confidence to you is a question that I've learned to use. And once they tell me that, I get a, a check-in that if I can deliver this, we'd have a deal. So the question is, how do I transfer the confidence that I have to you? Okay. Last question. What is your best advice for our audience to improve their closing ratio? Have a process that you know leads to a satisfactory conclusion. Process leads to closing. Okay. I just stopped the clock. Ready for your time? No, but go ahead. Give me your best. <laughs> Two minutes and 28 seconds. So yeah, still. I, I got a little long-winded on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That was good. That was it's still Stu, one of, it's Stu is still the champion. He's still the champion. That's right. He's got the, those bragging rights on you there. So, um, why don't we wrap today's show up with your number one piece of advice for those that are in our audience. And these are complex technical B2B sellers. Keep that in mind. So what is your number one piece of advice for our audience? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you two. One is to develop a work ethic and that may be work smart. It may be work hard, but if, if you've got a complex sale and you know that it's going to be a cycle, you know, it's not going to, one call, one close, which I no longer deal with. I have very few clients that have one call, one close. But you need to have a work ethic that says, I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to stay after it. And the second, especially if you have a long sales cycle, is self-belief. Because you've got to have the confidence in yourself that I can hang in there through the cycle and also the self-belief that I can compete with anybody in my space. 
work ethic and self-belief, I think, carry the day a lot of the time. Not every, not all, but a lot of the time. Excellent. Excellent advice. So how can our audience best connect with you? They can take out a $100 bill, write their name. <laughs> the best way to connect with me is Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, Brian at FlanaganTraining.com. Flanagan is spelled F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N. Brian at FlanaganTraining.com. Great. In the movie Cocktail, Tom Cruise played the character Brian Flanagan, but he spelled his name incorrectly. <laughs> the difference between me and Cruise, I'm tall and my wife's better looking. <laughs> Brian at FlanaganTraining.com. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Brian. I really appreciate your time in joining us today, and hopefully our audience uh, found some great value. I, I, I've took copious notes here. I got a whole full page of, uh, of copious notes here. So I uh, look forward to putting the podcast out there and having everyone benefit from you. So thank you so much for your time. John, I appreciate it. Keep fighting a good fight and grow, get them. There you go. There you go. So thank you also to all the sales achievers out there, our audience who took the time to listen to today's interview. I appreciate it. Look forward to everyone applying some of the sales wisdom that Brian provided during today's interview. So now, as always, let's wrap up today's episode with a few quick reminders. Real quick, before we end today's episode, I wanted to just share a few quick reminders with you. Um, no matter where you listen to the Sales Integrity Podcast, uh, please subscribe to it. Just subscribe to the show so you get them automatically on a weekly basis. Um, the more subscribers we have, the more we're found out there by other uh, potential subscribers, so that greatly helps the show. We are now on Stitcher Radio, so in addition to Stitcher, we're on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. And no matter where you subscribe or listen to us, please provide a five-star rating and a quick one to two-sentence review. That also helps others find the podcast. So uh, help us grow the show. That would be great. Um, and also, we still have our free seven-day video email course out there. You can go to mastercomplexselling.com uh, to subscribe to that. So again, mastercomplexselling.com. It's a free seven-day video email course titled Seven Steps to Master the Game of Complex Technical Selling. So that'll do it for today. Go out there in the sales world today. Help your customers buy what they want, what they need, and what benefits them. And most importantly, go out there and make it a great day.